Welcome everybody to this newest edition of the Silver Screen Action Figure Podcast. This is your host, Andre Joseph of AJ Epics Productions. I wish I could be coming on here on more in an exciting kind of mood, but as everybody knows, this coronavirus that's hitting us is really gotten to serious levels of concern. And, you know, we were planning for our next episode to do an entire piece on Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. We were going to do a whole round table to discuss the films and, of course, our love for the original Playmates toys, as well as talking about figures spawned from the movies. But, of course, it's been difficult with schedules. And as some of you probably know, we I was busy trying to get my film American Gunslingers together and we just started a Seed and Spark campaign which I will leave a link at the end of this video if you'd like to contribute to it and I was prepping that film up as well as another project at the same time which was really starting to take up many of my days which was why I haven't been able to podcast as much but in the wake of everything that's going on right now and it can only drive people nuts if there's nothing to do, if we're all going to start getting locked down because of this virus. I think if there's any outlet at all to get something out there and discuss my love, not just for films, but for action figures, especially the ones that I grew up with, then this is the way to do it. So that being said, I want to also send best wishes to Tom Hanks and his wife Rita Wilson who've been contracted with the virus and I wish them a speedy recovery and I also wish anybody else who is going through this ordeal right now wherever you are please be safe and for those of you who have it we are in your prayers and we certainly wish you a speedy recovery because it's a really scary situation right now, but I am optimistic because of things that I've seen and the resolve of society, as crazy as things are, that somehow we will get through this. And it's going to take time. It's going to take a lot of adjusting, but we will find a way to get through one of these dark chapters in life not just in america but around the world so everybody please be safe wash your hands keep your hands off your face just practice good hygiene as much as you can and drink a lot of fluids especially water and i promise you hopefully we will get through this in due time so now I got to give you guys a little bit of an escape because that's the best thing that we can do right now if we all have to stay home and find some kind of content. Whether you like this podcast or you don't because you're bored to tears by my voice, I am trying to entertain you and educate you at the same time for those of you who probably don't remember any of these action figures. So I decided... I want to tackle a long-awaited topic that I've been wanting to do actually since the fall, but I've just been sidetracked for so long. And that is the action figures based on the movies of the legendary Steven Spielberg. And I don't think there's really much of an introduction that I have to make. Jaws, E.T., Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Raiders of the Lost Ark, Jurassic Park, Ready Player One, Saving Private Ryan... Minority Report, the list just goes on and on of all the classics that this man has given us from the 70s to today. He continues to be an innovator in cinema, considered one of not just one of the greatest filmmakers of all time, but one of the greatest storytellers of all time. And his influence has captivated audiences around the world and influenced God knows how many filmmakers, including yours truly, to get into this business. You know, I even remember how excited I was in my teens when I got the Steven Spielberg's Director's Chair PC game. I remember how heavily hyped that was on Entertainment Tonight and all the entertainment shows just for the first time, even before I started making movies myself. 
to be doing a program where Steven Spielberg shows you how to make movies and you're shooting and editing a film with Quentin Tarantino and Jennifer Aniston. You know, it was that one where Tarantino was supposed to play like some prisoner on death row and Jennifer Aniston's like his girlfriend trying to, uh, you know, get him exonerated before he gets taken out. So, I mean, it's kind of corny now when I look back at it, but at the time, I certainly learned a lot about film just from playing that game. And, you know, I think there was so much that Spielberg taught me just by watching his films and the way that he tells a story. I could go on and on about it with the films he's directed as well as the films that he's produced. And with many hits that he's had, a lot of them have had toy lines, action figures, video games, etc. So... With this particular episode, I'm only going to focus on some of the more obscure ones that people may or may not remember. So in this particular case, I'm not going to talk about Indiana Jones because I briefly talked about the Indiana Jones figures with the Junk Man, if you ever seen the Dat Junk Man interview. And I do intend to tackle Indiana Jones on his own in the near future. We're not talking about Men in Black because I mentioned that in the Will Smith episode. And we're not going to talk about Jurassic Park, because we did a Jurassic Park episode, so that doesn't have to be discussed. So I'm only going to get into the ones that he directed, that had figures, or even ones that you may not remember, as well as the movies that he produced that are also kind of worth mentioning. So let's go back to 1975. 1975, we had his first major blockbuster, and that was Jaws. You know, the movie about the shark that attacks the town of Amity... And here's Roy Scheider, Robert Shaw, and Richard Dreyfuss sent out to try to take the shark out. Everybody knows the story. It was a film that we know was a very troubled shoot that almost could have killed careers, but Spielberg being the genius that he was, he was able to make it work. It was saved in the editing room. It was saved by the John Williams score. And it changed cinema forever because it created the trend of the summer blockbuster. So Hollywood was never the same after this. Now, toy lines were not a big thing back in those days. It was still a relatively new trend. We're only two years away from Star Wars, which really was the game changer. So the only real merchandise we got in terms of toys for Jaws was we had a Jaws doll of Bruce the Shark himself. It was made by a company called Chemtoy. Basically, it just looks like a rubber shark, you know, much like what you see in the movie. And it's got the Jaws label on the back. And there will be various different Jaws toys to come over the years. Probably the one you may know now are the Funko toys. So in 2016, the company Funko, with the reaction line, decided to make a couple of action figures based on the movie Jaws. And they did them in the style of Star Wars, in the three-quarter inch setup. And in that style, as if they were made by Kenner back in the day. So they made figures of Chief Brody, Hooper, and Quint. They all pretty much have that old-school look to them, have the resemblance of the costumes that they wore in the films. Uh, Chief Brody's got the famous rifle that he uses to kill the shark at the end of the film. Hooper... Totally looks like Roy, uh, not Roy Scheider, he looks like Richard Dreyfus. You know, he's got the beard, he's got the glasses, he's bright colored blue. I don't remember him being that bright in the film, but whatever. And he's got his camera. Quint, who was played famously by the late Robert Shaw, he's got his harpoon gun, he's got the hat, he's got the mustache, he's got pretty much everything. And of course, you couldn't make this line without making the shark itself. So much like this other shark that was made in 75, you got a great white of Bruce the shark. And it comes with the gas canister in its mouth that it ultimately takes it out. So I know this has been a popular collector's item for all Jaws fans. that They've made little displays and dioramas over the years. And... I know there's also been some Jaws dolls made recently. There's a Chief Brody doll that I believe NECA created. I don't have the picture of it in front of me right now. But that's certainly been kind of a big deal over the years. You know, the shark is just as famous as the actors who were in it. And, you know, certainly Jaws is still that summer classic that you go to every year. 
Now, again, during this whole period, toy lines were not a big thing until Star Wars came along. So movies like Close Encounters in 1941 did not have action figure lines whatsoever. Close Encounters, I believe it had a board game that Milton Bradley made, but that was about it. I don't remember if there were any models made of the alien ship at the end of the movie. Although it would be kind of cool now if you could find something like that and get that Jaws uh, Richard Dreyfus figure. And then you could kind of do the Close Encounters thing in your own room. So that's as close as we may get to something like that. Uh, 1941 was just such a huge bomb. It had potential for action figures, but it just was too big of a disaster. And again, we're skipping over Raiders because we've already talked about that a bit in the Junk Man episode. So we'll jump to the real merchandising cow for Spielberg, maybe the first one, and that was E.T. the Extraterrestrial. So E.T., if you are living under a rock, it was a phenomenon in its day. You're talking about a movie that touched the world, as they say. The story of a boy who finds an alien in his backyard, befriends it, connects to it, and finds a greater connection than he ever had to like even his own father. You know, And then the government tries to take it out nearly dies not a dry eye in the audience when it looked like et was going to die until finally he gets revived and that famous scene of elliot and his friends on the bike trying to get him back home so et was a phenomenon in 82 you had reese's pieces sales go up you had michael jackson before any scandals who was so huge into it, he got to narrate the storybook and wrote songs for the storybook. There were other songs written by Neil Diamond and James Taylor based on this movie. And there was an infamous Atari game that pretty much shut down Atari back in its day. But that just tells you how big of a deal E.T. was, that it was everywhere. It was just as big as Star Wars at that moment. And a game changer for Steven Spielberg's career that I think... Jaws made him a legend, but E.T., coming off of the heels of Raiders of the Lost Ark, made him into the superstar director that he is today. And because E.T. connected to kids so much, you had this company, LJN, make a series of E.T. toys that kind of sold pretty well back in its day. So you had a whole series of E.T. PVC figures. They're very small. Some of them I have, some of them I don't. I pretty much are all just variations of E.T. himself. So, I'm not going to go through all of them or in, the, in full detail, but you had E.T. with the blanket and his heart light looking like it's glowing, but it's just like paint on his chest. You had the blue bathrobe E.T. with the yellow phone, which I think I have somewhere. And I have the blue bathrobe with the coffee cup that i actually remember that's actually sitting in my bathroom right now as i recall you had et with the doll you had et in the dress that drew barrymore gives him et with the flower et with the flower pot um and it's like two different poses so you have one with a black and white striped scarf the other one is just him and the plant you have E.T. with the phone pointing his finger, you know, the E.T. phone home part. You had E.T. with the purple sheet, which is a sheet over him and, a, you know, his chest glowing red. You have E.T. with a blanket reading a book. This I remember having. And E.T. with the white blanket, another figure that I also had. Uh, you also had E.T. with an umbrella. And looks like he's wearing like a jacket or a brown blanket of some kind. I actually don't remember this part in the movie at all. So, I mean, it, it looked much like Star Wars, the way that they would take every scene and make an action figure out of it. They were doing it very early on with E.T. You also had Speak and Spell E.T., which was like a slightly bigger figure than the and basic And this one assortment. actually has a button in the back 
that you could slide up to make his arms and his head move into multiple different directions to make it look like E.T. is talking to you. You had the one and only figure of Elliot in this line, and that was E.T. and the Power Bicycle. So this is the one that has like the plastic string in the back of the bike that you pull, and then it pretty much levers up so that the bike could just go off on its own. It's really like a spring-loaded bike with Elliot and E.T. on the bike to recapture that famous scene in the film. And I can't really look to see if it's got Henry Thomas's likeness, but it pretty much is his character. He's got the red hoodie, he's got the jeans on. It's the same bike from the movie. So if you want to recapture that scene, you had your one and only Elliot figure right here. You had two versions of the famous spaceship in the movie. You had the spaceship launcher. And the spaceship launcher opens up the door and there's a button you push and E.T. actually shoots out of it. So it's sort of like a weird kind of, almost like a missile launcher like you would see in a G.I. Joe toy. It's a little shocking they would do this, but I guess, you know, if it's only shooting from the floor and not upwards of somebody's face like the Boba Fett toy, then I guess L.J.N. thought it was safe to sell back then. And then there was another version of the spaceship, this is the stunt spaceship, which actually spins, does a wheelie, it pops a wheelie. So, I don't know, a bunch of Mexicans made this one? <laughs> there was some wind-up E.T. toys that you would have, like, the button on the side, you wind it up, and it would start to move its legs on its own. And you also had a wind-up version of the spaceship with E.T. in it. Of course, you couldn't go without some talking E.T. dolls, and there were three versions of it. One of just a bare naked E.T., one that had a blue bathrobe, and they all pretty much, they, they could pose, they could say lines from the movie, E.T. phone home, E.T. ouch, E.T. be good, you know, Elliot. And there was even a Toys R Us exclusive E.T., which had uh, E.T. wearing a t-shirt that said, I'm a Toys R Us kid. Uh, that kind of brings a tear to my eye, I gotta tell you the truth. And that was it for E.T., but interestingly enough, you know, some of these figures were released in box sets as well. There was like the entire set of those little E.T. toys that I talked about, but we were supposed to get a lot more than what got released. You know, I don't have it in front of me right this second, but L.J.N., which was notorious for having prototypes to toys that never came out, they actually had a whole set of other E.T. figures that were set to come out all in PVC form. And I remember seeing a picture of not only an Elliot figure on his own without the bike, but there were also supposed to be figures of his mom played by Dee Wallace, Drew Barrymore's character Gertie, the brother Michael, even Peter Coyote's character Keys was supposed to have a figure where he's dressed in the hazmat suit. So yeah, we were supposed to get the human characters, and I guess either because they didn't think they would sell well, or just E.T. could only sell on its own, they never came out. And there was even a big, giant play set of the spaceship, which had like all these little contraptions and flower pots and other stuff that also was supposed to come out, and there's a huge display of it never came to be because i guess what could you really do i mean how much action is there in et it's not like playing with star wars figures so i guess it was just one of those things where just the appeal of having an et doll or et you know pvc was enough to display but not so much that you could just play with it and have villains and whatever else not you know bad guy fbi agents unless they did come up with that keys figure then you could probably do something like that, but we didn't get those figures, unfortunately. But here's the irony. So, around 2001, just before the 20th anniversary release of E.T., a company called Pacific Playthings made an entire series of E.T. toys. And these were, unlike the LJNs, they, were, they had more articulation. I don't know if they would have made the greatest, to be honest. I mean, the E.T. figures had the eyes way too big and a little too creepy at points. Some were painted way too brown. But this was the one and only time when you finally got action figures of all the human characters. So, 
without going too heavy into it, you had these basic assortment figures of Elliot, of Gertie, of Peter Coyote's character Keys, who they call the Key Man here. Because if you remember the movie, he most of the time you only saw him from the waist down and he was only indicated by his keys because, you know, he would be chasing E.T. to the flashlight. You know, they didn't want to really emphasize the adults except for the mom. Uh, there were two packs with E.T. and Elliot, two packs with E.T. Gertie, and one with E.T. and Key Man. Uh, there was one with Gertie and the dog. You had Key Man on his own. You had Key Man with the net launcher, so I guess when they try to go and capture E.T. And there was a figure of Michael. There was a figure of Michael with the bicycle. And there were also... Uh, the spaceman, which I don't think was Keys, but it was just like one of the guys in those uh, hazmat suits, you know, when they were trying to do all the testing on E.T. And there were also Polly Pocket sized E.T. figures in addition to more dolls and a whole box set of all the human characters. So, yeah, that we were able to get those figures later on after E.T. was popular. But I don't think they were big sellers. They were probably more collector's items that I do remember seeing in Toys R Us. We did even get some play sets too. So we got the spaceship again. We got the we got the medical lab. We got that famous van that would park outside Elliot's house, which weirdly enough has the ET logo on it. I mean, these are government guys. Why would they even like say, "Oh, ET's cool. We're gonna put his name on there." weird and there was also an elliot room place and they all came with figures by the way so this would have been cool to have in 1982 but 2001 the ship had already sailed so now we'll fast forward about two years later so spielberg now becomes a big super producer and anything he touches turns to gold or most of the stuff that he did would turn to gold and so we were able to get other hit films of his that would have action figure lines. One of them most notably was the 1984 hit Gremlins. And much like E.T., LJN would take on the license and they would make a whole set of E.T., uh, not E.T., uh, Gremlins toys because Gizmo was just so damn cute. What kid in America didn't want a Gizmo? But they would also want their own gremlin as well because they were fun to have as long as they weren't real and you didn't feed them after midnight. So LJN kept it pretty basic. We got small figures and we got large figures. So the basic figures were primarily just small articulated figures of Gizmo himself with only his arms and legs moving. And you also had the Moggy Stripe who ultimately becomes the main uh, gremlin bad guy in the movie. And I don't think he poses at all. He's just pretty much stationary with his arms and his head pretty much all in one spot. So there's really not a lot of art articulation here. You had a bendable figure of the character Stripe, and that's pretty much deadly accurate to the gremlin you see in the movie. And so that's like, you know, a nice little bendable figure here. You also had large large versions of the gremlins toy so you had a large gizmo and you had a large stripe so these were the only figures they made they were not making zach galligan and vb kate's characters and weirdly enough they didn't make any other gremlins and then we also got a water hatcher so this is like a gremlin like if you remember when they feed after midnight then they get all embryotic they actually have something like this so that they could squirt out little gremlins with when you pour it in with water i thought that was pretty cool and you had some wind-up toys you had a wind-up gizmo and a wind-up stripe much like with the et figures they could actually have like the button on the side that you wind up and then it can move around so that's what you got from the et uh not et <laughs> That's what you got from the Gremlins figures in 1984. And when the sequel came out in 1990, the company Applause made a series of PVC toys. So you got more variety of Gremlins. And these actually I remember collecting. So you have a PVC gizmo and you have all the famous Gremlins that were in that film, which I know Joe Dante prefers over the original. Uh, the characters of Daffy, Candy... Uh, those were like the ones that were still like the little moggies, just like Gizmo. And then you have the actual gremlins themselves. Uh, Mohawk, 
the chef, you have uh, the smart gremlin with the pipe and the glasses that I think Tony Randall voiced in the movie. And you had the famous Greta gremlin, the only one that was like a transsexual. And none of them moved. They're pretty much, you know, plastic. And I only saw these in comic stores. So they were not ones you could easily find like a Toys R Us. But I had some of these. I still have them displayed somewhere, especially the Mohawk and the Gizmo. And these were pretty cool. I think they were a little better than the LJNs, to be honest. And as we know, NECA made a whole bunch of Gremlins toys uh, based on different moments in the movie, even the Flasher Gremlin. And Funko with Super 7 also went and made, with the reaction line, a couple of the Gremlins toys, as well as making Zach Gallagher and Phoebe Kate's characters. So Gremlins was really hot. And I think it's still classic now. And I know there's supposed to be like an animated series coming out on HBO. These were cool to have. And you can't go wrong. I, I hope when they ever do reboot it that it's not going to be fully CG. I, I prefer the puppeteering work that Joe Dante did here. Now a year after Gremlins came out, we also got another highly beloved 80s classic from Steven Spielberg. And that was The Goonies. But weirdly enough, the Goonies didn't have an action figure line at that time. I guess because the Indiana Jones figures weren't big sellers, maybe there was a risk in making action figures of kids, because I guess kids can idolize Indiana Jones, or they could idolize Luke Skywalker, but they couldn't idolize other kids like themselves going into adventures, because maybe kids want to be the Goonies. They don't want to play with the Goonies. So the only thing I remember them putting out was a PVC figure of Sloth, but I don't remember what company made it. But back in 2007, Mezco came out with a number of Goonies action figures, all of which were made almost like in a very Norman Rockwell kind of molding for the most popular characters in the film. And all of which have the dead-on likeness of the Goonie characters. So they had action figures of Mikey, who came with his bag of marbles. He had the, the treasure map. He had copper bones. He had the inhaler. And I think he even had like that little skull key that he would find the, the lighthouse in. Chunk, he came with the famous uh, Statue of David that he breaks, the one with the, you know, Mikey's mom's favorite part. I'm not going to go further than that. He has a slice of pizza and a milkshake. He's got that famous Hawaiian shirt that he wears. I mean, this figure is totally perfect. Then you had Corey Feldman's character, Mouth. He's got a lantern. He's got the pirate treasure, pirate sword. He's got his hairbrush. And you had the character of Data, you know, played by uh, Kihai Kwan from Indiana Jones and Temple of Doom. And he's got all the real cool stuff. Remember, he was like the guy with all the James Bond-style gadgets that he would make in his home. He's got a bully buster. He's got the pinches of the pearl. He's got dynamite and a sticky dart. So everything you remember in the movie, he's got the trench coat. So that's pretty awesome. And you got Sloth. And Sloth comes with the pirate hat, a pirate sword, dead on... This is the guy. The only thing they left out, though, if you notice, they don't have the Superman logo on his T-shirt. That if you remember in the end of the movie, when Richard Donner has his little Superman nod, having directed the 78 movie with Christopher Reeve, that's not here, most likely due to copyright reasons. And so those were the only good Goonies figures they had. They did not make Mikey's brother, who was played by Josh Brolin. They didn't make Andy... Or Steph, and they didn't make the Fratellis, unfortunately. I guess they were not big sellers back then, but I do recall seeing these prototypes when I was at New York Comic Con that year. I've just never been compelled. As much as I love the Goonies, I've never been compelled to buy the toys, and maybe for the very reasons that I mentioned. And once again, Super 7 would, actually not Super 7, but Funko, when they had the reaction line, made figures of basically all the characters that I just mentioned, but they... You know, they do it in the Kenner style, and it's a little strange, because, you know, like, the chunk figure is not as chunky as the chunk that I mentioned in the Mezco line, or even just in the movie itself. They made him, like, as thin as uh, the actor Jeff Cohen is today. 
but they did make data with the same gadgets and he's got the thing that pulls out from his sleeve you got mikey with the very thing with the skull that i talked about mouth has the treasure map sloth's got the pirate hat and again doesn't have the superman shirt although actually san diego comic-con 2014 put out an exclusive sloth with the superman logo on his shirt and that's pretty cool to have but probably very difficult to find but again they didn't make brand they didn't make the other characters and that's weird unless there's like a licensing issue that they can only make so many goonie characters and even with the fratellis i can't explain that one guys that, that's strange so maybe it's just these were the only actors willing to sign off on their likenesses while Brolin and Carrie Green and Martha Plimpton probably would not. And maybe Robert Dobby and Joe Pagliano probably wouldn't do it. I, I actually speak to Joe on Instagram, so maybe he could explain that to me one day. And perhaps Annie Ramsey's estate wouldn't allow for a Moffatelli figure, which is very unfortunate if that's true. And how can I not talk about Steven Spielberg without talking about Back to the Future. If there was any action figure line that I wish I had as a kid, it would have been that. Because to me, it was one of the greatest trilogies next to Indiana Jones and Star Wars to me. But in 1985, you got to remember that Back to the Future was a big risky movie to make because of the fact that you have a teenager going back in time when his parents were teenagers and the mother falling in love with him by accident. So that was a risk for any studio to make a movie like that. But thankfully, you know, these performances were so genuine and so true. It makes the movie just as much memorable as the DeLorean or the soundtrack or anything else that people remember the most about Back to the Future. But back in 85, as well as when the sequels came out in 89, 90, there were no toys. I mean, there were no action figures of Michael J. Fox or Christopher Lloyd, likely down to licensing and likely down to the fact that maybe kids didn't know how to play with a Marty McFly or a Doc Brown. So we had to suffice with a lot of model toys of the DeLorean, which I had. You also had LJN put out a toy wind-up DeLorean as well as if you went to Universal Studios theme parks, they had the DeLoreans that actually can have the wheels go down and have like a little spring in the bottom of the DeLorean so that it looked like it could fly like in part two. So that's all you really had. And then in 1991, McDonald's made a couple of Back to the Future toys based on the animated series. And they made like an animated Marty on the hoverboard, Doc inside the DeLorean. They made Doc's kids. Those were as close as we had to figures of anything to do with Back to the Future. But in 2016, my dream came true when Funko Reaction finally put out Back to the Future toys in the Star Wars likeness. And I picked those up right away. This, this is what got me excited with the Reaction line. So you had figures based on Marty McFly, Doc Brown, George McFly, and Biff, all from the first Back to the Future Marty has his skateboard. Doc has that remote control that he used to control the DeLorean without a driver in it. Surprisingly enough, they didn't make any DeLorean toys for the figures to fit in. Uh, Funko also made what they called the Vinyl Idols, which were more cartoonized, more like Rick and Morty style figures of Marty and Doc. There's a whole ton of uh, pop vinyls of Marty and Doc in different outfits from all the films. Uh, pop Ride, so you had like a pop of a DeLorean with Marty McFly in it. I know Diamond Selects made a bunch of like the little uh, Kubrick style Back to the Future figures from all three movies. And just announced a Toy Fair this year, Reaction, now owned by Super 7, will be coming out with figures from Part 2 including uh, 2015 Marty and Doc, as well as alternate 1985 Biff and 2015 Biff. So no doubt about it, I'm collecting those as soon as they hit Amazon or eBay. I'm going to buy the whole set because I love Back to the Future. I will do anything for Back to the Future toys. And they're still in the box. I mean, I know Zack Ryder would say let them breathe, but in this case... These are ones for me to display because if I had them as a kid, I know I would play with them, but I'm a different kind of collector now. So no doubt 
I cannot wait. And if they do part three, I'm picking those up too. All right, so now we fast forward through the end of the 80s. There really wasn't too much else in the way of action figure lines. However, LJN, as I discovered a couple of years ago in their catalog on eBay, had plans for some other Spielberg-related toys that we were supposed to get but never came out. In 1987, there were two Spielberg-produced movies that didn't perform exactly to the level of a Back to the Future or Goonies or Gremlins. You had Harry and the Hendersons with John Lithgow. That was the one with, you know, the Bigfoot dude played by the late Kevin Peter Hall. And you had Batteries Not Included with Human Cronin and Jessica Tandy. They play the old couple that's being forced out of their building. But then these little flying alien ships come in and they start fixing up their home. And both of which, believe it or not, LJN had plans to make toy lines for both of these movies. And they were advertised in a 1987 Toy Fair ad. But there's no pictures of them. I think it was just announced that they were going to put figures out of these, but they never came out. On eBay, however, I have seen PVCs of the back, batteries not included spaceships of all the little spaceship characters, which I think LJN was going to do. But I don't know if LJN had anything to do with them. They might have been made by a separate company. And they'll be displayed here once I find them. And... While LJN did not make a Harry and the Hendersons doll, in 1990, Galoob would take on the license when Harry and the Hendersons was produced for television, and they made a Harry and the Hendersons doll, as well as a bendable action figure. So that was, and it was also played by Kevin Peter Hall in the series right before his untimely passing. So while LJN didn't quite pick up figures for that, other companies would pick up the ball. So we did get those but they're not so easy to find and they're probably not cheap if you've seen them on ebay so i guess we'll jump next into 1991 with hook hook if you remember was the movie about what would happen if peter pan grew up became a corporate yuppie and forgot what it was like to be a kid and then when his kids get kidnapped by Captain Hook as part of a revenge plot, he has to find himself again. So, I, you know, when Hook came out, I didn't know it was a Steven Spielberg movie. And I was actually very confused by the marketing because I just didn't know what was going on. I didn't realize that Kev, uh, Robin Williams, the legendary Robin Williams, was playing Peter Pan until maybe the last trailer of the movie. I only knew about Dustin Hoffman playing Hook. And Julia Roberts hot off a pretty woman playing Tinkerbell. So this was like a massive production. And for Spielberg, it was kind of a big deal. But it didn't live up to studio expectations. It's a beloved film then. It's a beloved film now. But considering the cost, it didn't quite live up to what the studio had hoped. And they were expecting a big franchise out of this. There were a whole bunch of video games. This was when Sony bought Columbia Pictures and they bought TriStar. So they were really banking on some big bucks on this. Now there's a lot of these figures. But all I could tell you for sure is that when it came to Hook, there may have been a licensing issue with getting the likenesses of all the actors. Because Rob Williams, Dustin Hoffman, Julie Roberts, they were all in the height of their careers at this time. So I think it was so expensive to get their likenesses that none of these figures have their likenesses whatsoever. You know, you had a couple different Peter Pan figures. You had the Air Attack Peter Pan, and the classic Peter Pan attire. You had swashbuckling Peter Pan that could kind of like bend around and do like a spring-loaded action with the sword. You had Food Fight Peter Pan. And you had a number of different hook figures, one that was tall terror where he could actually grow his legs out you had multi-blade hook with a bunch of different blading weapons and swiss army hook who could also like have interchangeable uh axes and claws and swords but none of them looked anything like the actors in the movie i would almost think they could pass for like the disney peter pan cartoon you know that that's just how off balance these figures were 
probably the better figures in the line were the Lost Boys, the Rufio, uh, the Thudbutt. Yes, his character's name was Thudbutt, the, the big black kid. And Ace, the, you know, was one of the other Lost Boys who had, like, the hat, and he had these cut-off gloves and the face paint on. And there's a number of other ones. And you also had Pirate Smee, played by Bob Hoskins. And we've mentioned Bob Hoskins a lot. I think this figure has a better likeness to him than some of the other characters, but it's still not exactly Bob Hoskins as Smee. Just it, it almost looks more like Anthony Hopkins as I look at it right now. And he's got some big-ass sword weapons that I don't remember him having. Probably the Rufio was the more popular because he got like the raft and the hang glider, and that was like his big thing in the movie since he was supposed to be like the cool Lost Boy leader. And there were some deluxe figures. This was before deluxe action figures were made cool. So you had a Captain Hook with skull armor, and you also had a Lost Boy attack croc. So this is like a fake crocodile that the Lost Boys could actually ride on to fight off Captain Hook and his men. And there was also a uh, Captain Hook henchman, Pirate Bill Jukes, who's a little one-legged bad guy. I'm wondering if this was the character Glenn Close played. You know, like, there, she had this cameo where she was totally unrecognizable with a beard, and, like, they overdressed her so you couldn't see her breasts. Um, I don't think it's her, but it, I kind of find it funny that they would make something like that here. And there were a whole bunch of vehicles. There was a Lost Boy attack raft, which looks almost like something they would use later for Waterworld, but this was Mattel. Waterworld was made by Kenner. And there was a strike attack tank for the Lost Boys that would shoot out like uh, some kind of boa arm missile type of deal. And that was it for Hook. I don't think there were any play sets planned, or if there were, they probably stopped making them before, you know, they realized the movie wasn't going to be that successful. There were no Tinkerbell toys. They didn't make Peter's kids. But you got the basic assortment of everybody that was in the film, at least the ones that people remember the most. There was no pirate ship play set, which probably would have been a nice addition to have. But, you know... It wasn't a big enough hit to warn all that stuff. McDonald's did make a couple of hook toys that I also remember collecting the whole set, except for maybe one of them. I don't remember. But they had, once again, none of them looked anything like the movie. They looked like they were straight out of the Disney cartoon. So you had Peter Pan on a raft looking nothing like Robin Williams. You had Hook on a sailboat. Looking nothing like Dustin Hoffman. And I, I can tell you now, I did not have this one. You had Rufio in a little makeshift raft that could shoot water. And you had Tinker, or not Tinkerbell. What am I talking about? You had one of the mermaids in the movie when they try to throw Peter off the plank and then the mermaids save him. That was a little obscure to do. I'm surprised they didn't do a Tinkerbell, but I guess Julia Roberts was too expensive to get the likeness for and I don't think we'll ever get a Julia Roberts toy of any kind. So I guess they just said, well, let's just make one of these little mermaids that saves him. You know, that's the best we could do. And it winds up too, so you could actually have it swim into your bathtub. And that was Hook. I don't know what else you could say, except they couldn't afford the licenses for the likenesses of these expensive actors. So that's probably the one disappointment about this line. So now... Let's now go into 1994. So now Jurassic Park comes out for Spielberg, also becomes a massive hit and a big merchandising seller, as we discussed in the Jurassic Park episode. So now as a producer, he was going to take the advent of CGI and the things that he had employed in terms of special effects, and now that was going to spread across films that he was producing as well. And one of those big films that he had was the film adaptation of Hanna-Barbera's The Flintstones. So The Flintstones, he actually was an executive producer, but they called him Steven Spielbrock in the credits. And Mattel would also take on this license as well. And they kind of went a little bit odd with like these oddly shaped Flintstone toys and I guess they want to emulate the look and feel of the cartoon but also 
have it where they would have the likenesses of the actors in the movie. And this is probably, I will say, these figures do look good and they were kind of fun to have back in the day. So let's begin. We have uh, a couple of different Flint Flintstones played by John Goodman. Here's the Hard Hat Fred, which is the classic Fred Flintstone that we all know and love. And he's got a couple of different tools and, you know, like a uh, turtle shell, hard hat, bird pick, uh, stony hammer. And all these figures, by the way, they're kind of rubbery with the heads. The heads you can actually sort of like squish and mold a little bit. But they do articulate with the arms. The legs don't articulate as much. They sort of remind me of the Dick Tracy toys, but just slightly, you know, not as Ninja Turtle-y as those, but kind of similar in many ways. There was Big Shot Fred. That's when he gets promoted in his job, and now he's wearing, like, the zebra-striped outfit with the red tie, and they give him, like, a sledgehammer and all kinds of, like, bossy kind of stuff. So those were the two that I recall here. You had a Wilma, played by the lovely Elizabeth Perkins, who comes with pebbles. There's no accessories here, but it's just, you know, Wilma in her classic Wilma outfit, pebbles, looking maybe a little more like the pebbles in the cartoon than in the movie, and she has, like, her little doll. You had Barney, played by the legendary Rick Moranis, probably his second action figure next to... Lewis Tully and Ghostbusters, even though that was from the real Ghostbusters cartoon. But this one has the classic Barney outfit. He's got his lawnmower. He has, uh, you know, that's it. He, he just has the lawnmower. Um, <clears throat> you have Betty, played by Rosie O'Donnell, who comes with Bam Bam. And again, just like with Wilma, there's no accessories here. Bam Bam's got his bat. Betty looks just like Rosie O'Donnell. Uh, actually, a, a thinner Rosie O'Donnell, I gotta say. You also had Dino, and this is Licking Dino, so, you know, this is like one of the few CG characters in the movie. And he's got the famous Bronto steak, he's got a bone in a dish, and, you know, obviously, he's supposed to be a lot like the Dino in the cartoon, and I, I think that was one where they did a really good job on and then you had the villain, Cliff Vandercave, played by Kyle MacLachlan from Twin Peaks. And, uh, yeah, he's the most serious of all the figures here. He's got his Dick the Bird, which is like his talking bird that would, I guess, spell out all the evil plans that he was doing and how Fred figures out his evil plot. He's got a bag of sand dollars and a stone slingshot. So he's supposed to be like the dangerous bad guy in this movie. And there's Filing Station Barney, which is basically, this is when Barney, I think he gets fired and he becomes like a gas attendant, a gas station attendant. So he's got a cap, he's got octopus squeegee, he's got a dino wrench, and he's got like the outfit he wears, or like, I guess like a prehistoric gas attendant uh, thing with the bow tie. So that's kind of cool. And then you had a couple of different... Uh, sort of little contraptions that they had that came with figures. So you had Crash Test Barney, which is just like slingshotting Barney out of some kind of contraption here. You had Bolarama Fred, which I guess is like a little bowling ball play set where uh, Fred Flintstone could actually like throw a bowling ball into a bunch of pins. There's Dino Drilling Barney. So I guess these were kind of deluxe figures that they had. And Big Bite Fred which looks like it actually could open its mouth and start eating stuff, just like Fred Flintstone himself. And it says here he takes a big bite for a big appetite. Okay. <laughs> he also had a bunch of bendable action figures, which I've actually never seen until now. But there weren't many of them. They only made bendables of Bam Bam, Barney, Betty... And they made Fred in his bossy outfit. They made Pebbles. They made Wilma. And they sold both the Flintstone and the Rubble families as packs. So one with only just the Flintstones and one only with the Rubble family. There were a bunch of dolls, like colorless soft dolls of Fred and Bam Bam and Pebbles and Dino. 
and there was also some dolls. They had like a classic animated Flintstones doll of Fred and a talking Fred Flintstone in the likeness of John Goodman. He had some mini dolls that looked nothing like the actors. He had motor, motorized cave cars. There was also the Polly Pocket style Pebbles World figures. There was a PVC Bam Bam. I think there were vehicles here too. I, I'm pretty sure... Looking at it now... Yes, there was a vehicle of the Flint, Flintmobile and also the LeSabre 25000, which is like the nice car that he gets when he becomes rich. But the Flintmobile is probably the one that everybody remembers the most because that was the one that he had in the cartoon. And that was it for the Flintstones. And they did not make Halle Berry's Sharon Stone character. I guess, again, her likeness was probably too expensive to make action figures for now, while this wasn't a Steven Spielberg movie in terms of directing, and he only produced as sort of like an uncredited producer, this is when he had formed DreamWorks in the late 90s, and he was giving all his buddies all kinds of different film projects that he could do under that banner. One of those was Joe Dante's movie Small Soldiers, which essentially was doing Gremlins all over again, but now with live action action figures that come to life just like in toy story and they fight each other and they're also attacking humans i'm not gonna get too deep into these but you had the basic figures of the chip hazard and his whole crew which included uh brick bazooka and nick nitro these are like you know the human gi joe type villains in the movie the, the whole idea of the movie was that these gi joe type guys were the ones that would be the bad guys and then the gorgonites who were more like these uh alien looking creatures would end up being the good guys and they can't fight back against chip hazard and his guys so there are a whole bunch of these figures both on the human army side and with the Gorgonites, including the leader Archer, who was voiced by the great Frank Langella, and Chip Hazard, by the way, was voiced by Tommy Lee Jones. So this was obviously to capitalize on the movie, and you know they had hoped that kids would see the movie and want to buy the toys, but it really wasn't a big hit to really be a big seller. I know also Burger King had some figures for this, so there's really not much I'm going to say here with Small Soldiers. Hasbro was in charge of the line, and they were trying to create the Gremlins vibe, but it just didn't quite hit the mark. So, not much else I'm going to say about Small Soldiers. And, you know, again, for the longest time, Spielberg pretty much had grown up after Jurassic Park. So he was doing movies like Schindler's List and Amistad, Saving Private Ryan. None of them really called to have toy lines of any kind. Yes, there would be more Jurassic Park movies. There would be another Indiana Jones. I think Tintin may or may not have had a toy line, but I'm not going to look that up right now. Maybe even the BFG. In terms of the producing work, we're not getting into Transformers because we talked about that in the Transformers episode. I'm actually shocked right now looking that he produced the Cats movie. What the hell was he thinking on that? And no figures for the Antonio Bandera Zorro movies so yeah i mean there, there really wasn't too much else the only, and we mentioned men in black so we don't have to talk about that the only other one that he had figures for was one of his more recent films ready player one and funko did a couple of different figures of all the avatars in the movie and they're sold in a four pack but this is the only thing that i really see and Honestly, I wasn't too crazy about Ready Player One. There were some moments I liked, especially the Shining scene, but I, I was the movie kind of let me down quite a bit. Uh, so no human characters here, just the ones that were in the the video game world that Ready Player One was set in. And that's all that I can honestly say about Steven Spielberg toys from his movies that he directed and produced. Uh, I think E.T. was probably the big one, and again, Indiana Jones was like kind of hit and miss all through time. Jurassic Park 
may have been even the bigger one, but we already discussed that before. If I have to say which toys I wish there were figures for for the movies that he made and produced, obviously, if they had done Back to the Future toys back in the day, I would have loved to have collected those. I think Close Encounters screams an action figure line, but it wasn't ever really necessary. Although, now that I think about it, I do think there was a bendable of the alien creature, and I'm going to try to find that before I put this podcast out. Um, You could see I've been so busy, I didn't really fully prepare for this there were no poltergeist toys which i'm shocked with and and that could have been something um and there was also i'm sure there were american tail figures somewhere and i'm going to try to see if i can find those but if there wasn't that's another one that i'm shocked about unless you can only get toys i know there were a bunch of fievel dolls at universal studios parks but in stores I think maybe Burger King or McDonald's did a line for Five O Goes West. So I'll put those up here if I do see them. And one that I really would have loved to see in action figures for in terms of the films that he produced was Inner Space. I would have loved to have had that little miniature ship that Dennis Quaid rides in, get a Dennis Quaid figure, get a Martin Short figure, or even Vernon Wells' character totally screams an action figure. But that wasn't a big enough hit to really warrant that. So unfortunately, that's why we never got it. Although Joe Dante did auction off a model ship of the ship from Inner Space. Uh, I think that screams reboot too. I, I might get some hate for this, Marcos. But yeah, I think Inner Space should be revisited again. Because I think that's an underrated classic. And that's basically about it for Steven Spielberg. I, I can't think of too much else in terms of toys that came off of any of the movies that he produced. There were the reunion toys of uh, young Sherlock Holmes, so I think that tells you all you need to know. And the BFG maybe had a line, but I don't think it's really worth mentioning here. So that's it for the Silver Screen Extra Year podcast for now. As always, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter at Silver Screen AF1, like, question, give us thoughts and feedback for future episodes at silverscreenafpodcast at gmail.com and guys once again i'm going to say it's getting really serious now especially all these alerts i'm getting on my phone right now so bunker in stay safe wash your hands you know practice good hygiene and just really be careful out there because it's getting kind of scary but i'm trying to be optimistic and saying listen it's gonna work out just stay positive be vigilant be safe and we'll get through this and if i have to keep doing a couple more of these podcasts to keep you guys occupied i am happy to do so so that's it stay safe and be careful out there 